waited for this day. We've gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire. We burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every heart of our praise. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face, your love. preaching to us this morning is about the holiness of God. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty Early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee Oh, and mighty, God. 
in our service, we will be taking part in communion. And as we examine our lives and we examine our hearts, we need to open up the eyes of our heart to make that connection with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't know Jesus this morning, there's plenty of time this morning. You have that opportunity. And if you know Him as your personal Savior, this will be a service this morning in which we can reconnect and we can reunite as we open our eyes of my heart. Sing it with us, please. <clears throat> open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Eyes of my heart, I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing. Holy, 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 I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. more time with no instruments. Cry it out. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. You know, Brother John, this morning we'll be preaching in 1 James. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. And every one of you here this morning in your families, in yourself, in your kids, in your parents, you have been tested. And the scriptures will tell us and reassure us this morning, we can stand that test of time and we will receive the crown of life as our reward. It is well with my soul. <clears throat> when peace like a river attends 
windeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well practice on Thursday night, that third verse of it is well, maybe, and, and this is dangerous, so I know this, it may be my favorite verse of any song that's ever been written, um, and uh, I'm a music person, I listen to music a lot, and uh, I love that verse, my sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more.
praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. What a great, great, great verse. Um, but it is not just the words of a grieving man, a grieving father, a grieving husband who wrote those song, that song, uh, thinking through the things that he's been through as a parent, uh, losing children in uh, an accident, uh, his wife barely surviving, losing their home in a fire, all those things. It's the words of a man who held confidence in God and in his word. And so today we uh, are going to turn to God's word, the only source of confidence that we have to explore the idea of where sin comes from and, and how this comes about. So as we think about this, I'm going to ask you a question. You ever, you ever sit and think, I am more like my mom or my dad than I ever thought I would be? Like, there are those things that our parents did. Like, here's, here's the thing for us. My brothers and I have two younger brothers, and we would get in fights, like, all the time. And my mom would hear us fighting and squabbling, and she would come in the room, and she would say, what's the problem? You ever say that or hear that as a parent, any of you? I, uh, so, so I used to hear that all the time. Now, it was interesting because when mom came in and asked that question, we would begin to tell her the problem and she would say, I don't care, just stop it. <laughs> and I thought, man, that's the weirdest thing ever. Like, number one, you already know what's going on. Number two, you don't care what's going on. All you want is for it to be over. And I thought, my mom is so weird. And she's going to watch this video now and know that I said she was weird, but that's okay, because I told her that this week on the phone anyway. But now, our kids, the, I know you won't believe this, our kids have fights. Uh, it happens even in the preacher's home. And we will, I, I walk in the room sometimes, and I, th- I say to them, what is the problem? And just like my crazy mom I don't care what the problem is. I just want it over. I find myself becoming more and more like my mom all the time, which I guess at the end of the day isn't a bad thing at all. By the way, I love you, Mom. Um, But we ask that question of our kids. And then there are times in our lives where we go, how did I get here? How did this happen? Like, how, how did I go from... Over here when everything was going great to being here where everything seems to be falling apart and over there when, when things are good with me and now I'm, I'm just embarrassed and I'm, I'm ashamed of the things that I've done. How did I get here? And we ask that question, what's the problem? Now God comes to us and God doesn't ask us when we're in the midst of our problems, in the midst of our struggles, in the fights in our lives. God doesn't come to us and say, what's the problem? Instead, God comes to us and says, let me tell you what the problem is. And he's very clear about it. He leaves no room for questioning or doubt about what the problem is. He tells us clearly and he tells us today through James. So we're going to read James chapter 1 verses 12 through 18, and we're going to learn what the problem really is. So if you're willing and able, I want to invite you to stand with me out of respect for God and his word as we read James chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. And here's what James writes to the church and to you and I. He says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. 
Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of His own will, He brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. Let's pray. Our Father, we bow before You today, and uh, there are so many things in this passage of Scripture that stand out, but... Uh, The one right now that stands out to me, Father, is that verse. In verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. God, we are a people who are easily deceived. Deception comes from outside us and from within us. We are a people who are easily deceived. So today, Father, would you pull the blinders from our eyes and help us to see the truth. The truth of who you are, the truth of we are, and the truth of our sin. Help us to embrace your truth and to walk in your truth as we follow you. Father, we pray that you would change us, that you would shape us, that you would mold us, and that you would help us to hate our sin the way that you do, so that we can love and follow Jesus the way that you would have us to. We ask these things in his name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, in this passage of Scripture, we read a couple of really important words that we have to cover before we can really uncover what the point of this passage is. And so those two words are trials and temptations. Trials and temptations. And so uh, the, the other, other idea wrapped up with trials is the idea of tests. And then kind of standing uh, in contrast is this idea of temptations. And so here's what we need to understand. God both allows and brings trials into our lives. God both allows and brings trials into our lives. There are bad things that come into all of our lives. And in James chapter 1, verse 2, we saw that when James said, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. He does not say, count it all joy, my brothers, if you meet trials of various kinds, but when. So they're going to come. And then he says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life in verse 12. We are so tempted sometimes to think that we have all kinds of problems. Like, like I have problems, but all these other people have it all together. And so we're going to burst that bubble really quickly this morning just so we can understand that we are all on a level playing field today. Do you know what you see when you look around this room? If you were to look around this room right now, and I'm not telling you you can't, so if you want to look around the room, you're welcome to do that. But if you look around the room, what you're going to see is a whole bunch of messed up people. There is not one single person in this room who has it all together. Not one. Not the one standing on the stage and not any of those sitting in the seats. This is a room full of people who are struggling and broken and hurting and lonely and vulnerable. It's who we are. People in this room had fights at home this week. Some of them this morning. People in this room have marriage struggles. They have rebellious children. People in this room are grieving, they're hurting, they have health struggles and financial struggles, they have fears and doubts and difficulties. This room is full of people who have hurts and habits and hang-ups that distract us and weigh us down and discourage us. And when you walked into this room this morning, some of you felt out of place because you thought you were the only one. And I can assure you, you are not. You fit right in. We are all people who are broken, who are hurting, who are facing tests and trials. And God allows those tests and trials to come into our lives for a purpose. We learned about that in James. James said that tests bring about perseverance. And perseverance, when we persevere, when we remain steadfast under trial, when we keep fighting and keep pursuing Jesus in spite of the difficulty that we're facing, God transforms us and causes us to become what he intends for us to be and that is mature Christians so the tests come and they shape us and mold us to be who God has saved us to be God allows trials but God also brings trials 
Now, it's easy for us to understand this deal with God allowing trials. We're, we're fine with that as Christians, but uh, this idea of God bringing trials might feel a little difficult for us to embrace. So let's just think about three Bible verses. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. Paul said, But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please men, but to please God. Sounds good. What comes next? But to please God who tests our hearts. God tests us. Proverbs chapter 17 verse 3. The crucible is for silver. The furnace is for gold. Those are ways that silver and gold are purified through heat, through trial, through, through difficulty. It says the crucible is for silver, the furnace is for gold, and the Lord tests hearts. Psalm chapter 26 verse 2 says, Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind. What a bold request of God. God, just go ahead and bring tests into my life. Test my heart. Test my mind. Make sure that I'm following after you. God tests us. God brings tests and trials into our lives, according to Proverbs chapter 17, verse 3, to purify us and to cause us to become more godly. God does test us. God does test us. But God does not tempt us. James says it here in verse 13. Let no one say when he is being tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. James is clear, he leaves no room for doubt. Testing comes from God, or it can come from God. It doesn't always, because the Bible also teaches that there are times when Satan tests us, when Satan sifts us. But while tests can come from God, temptations never come from God. God never tempts anyone. And there's a major difference between these tests or trials and the temptations that James says do not and cannot come from God. A trial or a test is a difficult situation, a circumstance or a period of life which is particularly difficult but is intended to purify us and make us more like Jesus. But a temptation is different. A temptation is an opportunity or an appeal to our human desire to do what violates God's rules and God's instructions and God's principles. A temptation is an opportunity to become less like Jesus where a trial or a test is intended to make us more like Jesus. But while a temptation is an opportunity to become less like Jesus, a temptation is not the same thing as a sin. In the New Testament Gospels, we read about Jesus going into the desert and being tempted by Satan, that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness in order that He might be tempted. And if temptations are equal to sin, then Jesus is guilty of sin. And if Jesus is guilty of sin, then we cannot be forgiven of sin by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross because His crucifixion would only provide the atonement for his own sin. It would only make him right with God. It wouldn't be enough for us. But Jesus was sinless. He was tempted, but he did not give in to that temptation. Now, what's interesting about this is that the root word for test and the root word for tempt are the same root word, which becomes really difficult, but a test is a noun. It's a thing. Uh, the, the word tempt is a verb. It's an action word. They're not exactly the same, but they're incredibly related. And so your tests can sometimes turn into temptations as you think, well, I can, I can behave in ways that God doesn't want me to. I'm going through a hard time. God's going to understand. He's going he's gonna, to he's gonna be all right with it. But that's just not the truth. The meaning is incredibly difficult or, or incredibly different as... As a test leads to more mature faith and a temptation can lead us to sin. And so with that kind of framework built so that we understand what temptation is and how this, how this works, we're going to dive deeper. 
And what we need to understand this morning is when it comes to sin, the problem is in you. The problem is in you, and it's in me. God does not want us to sin. He does not desire that we sin because sin is evil and evil is completely contrary to who God is and what God wants and what God does. God hates sin and God loves us and God knows that sin destroys us so He doesn't want us to sin. So He doesn't tempt us to sin. But we sin because we decide to sin. Look at verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own evil desire. So desire takes hold of you. You see something that looks appealable or appealing or enjoyable or satisfying and you want that thing or you hear something that sounds good and it makes you ask questions and you begin to doubt or you feel something. When someone says something hurtful and you're wounded in your mind or your heart, Or someone says something and you feel anger. It just rises up in you and you want to lash out and fight back. Or somebody tells you about that opportunity to make some more money. Or or they present an opportunity to do something you know you shouldn't do. But it sounds fun. It sounds pleasurable. Or you see something attractive and your eyes want to linger. You need to understand that when that happens, sin hasn't happened yet. You haven't acted yet, but you're playing with fire. And you're a nanosecond's decision away from disaster. Now that word, luring and enticing, uh, is a fishing word. And so, I understand this. This morning, when David walked in with a t-shirt, I thought, man, I could have worn shorts and a fishing shirt and been really comfortable. Wouldn't that be great? David, warn me when you're going to wear a t-shirt again. So when we think of fishing, like when I started fishing, my grandpa bought me my first fishing pole. And when he bought me that, he bought me bobbers and hooks, and then I had to go out and buy worms or crickets. And when you fish that way, you just kind of put your lure out, and you wait. And you just kind of hope a fish swims by. And it never does. You just sit there. And then after a while, you just put your pole down and think, well, I'll just I'll just watch. And then if you're not a kid and you're you're an adult, you're sitting in a comfortable chair and you end up falling asleep. If you are a kid, you wander off and start throwing dirt and rocks and all that stuff into the water to chase the fish away or, or you start picking at the grass so you can make a salad for later when you don't catch any fish that's not that's not the idea we need to get about sin when it talks about luring and enticing instead what we need to get the idea of is the idea that I use when I fish my favorite way to fish by the way this is my favorite bait it's a little crawfish when it floats in the water it floats upside down And its arms go like this. Woo! And what you do, take this little craw, and you get on your boat, and you just start going like this. Just scaring Mackenzie. Trying to put it in your pocket. She put it in the water. You just kind of leave it there for a little bit. The hook's buried. You're not going to get hooked. And you sit there, and every little bit, you'll just kind of shake it a little bit. And you think, there's got to be a fish in there. It just looks perfect. Sometimes you can actually see the fish underwater. If you've got good sunglasses, you sit there. And you just twitch it. Let it kind of float around. Then maybe you don't catch a fish there, so you come over here. Just put that right there, just like that. Just keep putting it in there. And twitch it a little bit. And you hope that fish will look at that bait. And if, after a while, a crazy thing happens. You'll finally get one, and you'll see that craw. It's sitting there, woo, here I am, I'm a crawfish. 
And eventually he'll take it in his mouth. And then you got him. Yank that hook. You just, like what you do is you try to yank their lips off their face. Uh, that's how you fish. Uh, and that hook gets buried because they bit. Sin kind of sits in front of us and waves its arms at us. Here it is. Look how good it looks. Look how fun it'll be. Look how pleasurable this is going to be. All the while there's a hook inside. But it's just waving its arms. Nothing looks dangerous. It doesn't look like that big a deal. That's what happened with Adam and Eve. Read the book of Genesis. Just the first few chapters. Satan doesn't stick the hook in Eve's mouth. She, he doesn't take the apple off the tree. He just tells her, look at it. Just take a look. Just take a look. Just doubt what God said. The apple is just, or whatever it was, the fruit's just hanging there on the tree. And finally she reaches up and picks it, takes a bite, gives it to her husband, who takes a bite. That's the idea about what happens with sin. That's what James is telling us. Like, it's just the, the thing, whatever it is, may not be that bad. It's just sitting there in front of you. It may not seem bad. It may look really good. And we look at it, and I've seen fish. as they, you, you just keep putting that in the same spot. You just keep pitching that in the same spot. And after a few minutes, finally, they just... They've had enough. They can't take it anymore. They can't resist it anymore. They've probably got scars in their mouth where they've been hurt before by the same lure. But they go for it anyway. So our desire is there in front of us. And, and it's appealing to things that, that are, are pleasurable. So Jesus, when He's tempted, He's tempted to fill His belly. Which doesn't sound so bad. Just make some bread and eat it. That sounds okay. But don't do it God's way. Or to seek power. Or to, to show off God's protection in His life. And, and to test God. And, and all those things. None of it seems that bad. Like when you read those temptations, it just seems like, oh, well, what's bad about that? Well, what's bad about it is you're, you're trying to force God's hand. You're going about things in ways that are completely contrary to what He wants. If you don't des d deny your sinful desires, that thing you, that you want, that person that looks good, or that release that makes you feel so much better, then you take the bait in your desire leads to sin. So now you've acted. You've got desire and then you've acted on that sin. Desire, James says, gives birth to sin. And it's almost like when James is talking about this, like we need to think about grandpa, son, and grandson. So desire is grandpa. Desire has given birth to sin. So, so now sin has acted the second generation has arrived. Sin's sin is desire's offspring. So, so now you've done that thing God says not to do, or you've chosen not to do what God says to do. The idea is that you've missed the mark. That's what sin means. It means to miss the mark. So uh, I, I shoot bows too. So you, you pull the bow back, and you settle in, and you trigger the release, and you want to hit the bullseye in the middle. Like you just want to hit that tiny spot. But, but when you sin, not only did you miss that tiny spot, the bullseye, you missed the target altogether. So now, for you and I, we think about our sin and we think, well, sure, I did that, but I'm still a good person. Right? How many times have we heard that? How many times have we said that? We're guilty of our sin, but our self-identity, the way that we think about ourselves, is that we're still a good person. We just made a mistake. And it's our nature to do that, especially in the Western world. But when we think about the sins and misdeeds of others, we think about this in completely different terms. And so it's audience participation time. Okay? When you murder someone, we start calling you what? A murderer. When you steal something, we start calling you a thief. Or when you lie, we start calling you a 
liar. Because now we identify your sins become your identity. Your sin becomes who you are. Meanwhile, our sins are just mistakes. My sin, it's just a mistake. I murdered somebody, but I'm not a murderer. I'm still a good person. I just made a mistake. But you murdered someone, and you're a murderer. You're a horrible person. And we think about that all the time. And, and we have a couple of problems. See, we, we sinned, and that made us, not, not a person who made a mistake, our sin made us a sinner. It's now our identity. That's who we are. Every single one of us. And James doesn't leave us there. He says, desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Third generation has arrived and now we die. When you are guilty of sin and you have the moral capability to understand your guilt, even if you don't agree with it or understand it completely, you still stand under a death penalty. So because you sin, you stand under a death penalty. Death is the third generation of this family tree of sin. Temptation is grandpa that brings forth sin, which is the dad that brings forth death. And because you're guilty... The penalty is physical death which enters into human existence because of sin and spiritual death which is experiencing God's punishment and never again experiencing His blessings or His love. And that's a reality. It's not just something we think about. It's not just something that we we talk about. It's not just something that words in a book. It's the truth. And underneath it all, it's all your fault. That's what the Bible says. We play the blame game. When the first sinner sinned, Adam and Eve, they played the blame game. God looks at Adam and he says, did you eat the fruit of the tree? And what's Adam say? That woman you gave me. So he's blaming her and God. And God looks at Eve and he says, did you, did you, what have you done? And she says, the serpent. The, the devil made me do it. The husband blames the wife, the wife blames the devil, but shifting blame doesn't remove their guilt. And that blame game is in us. We blame our parents. Well, they didn't raise me right. You know, they didn't show me what was right, and so now I do wrong, but it's my parents' fault. Or we blame our spouse. They don't treat me right or do what I want, so, so I do wrong. Or we blame our kids. They don't behave, and so I do wrong. My anger is really, it's their fault. Or we blame our boss. If he would pay me more, I wouldn't have to steal. Or we blame our situation. I have to cut corners. I just can't get ahead in life. You don't know what life is like for me. But shifting blame doesn't restore innocence. It just adds to the guilt. Because refusing to take responsibility and and living in selfish pride are both sins. According to all that we read and see in Scripture, the only individual responsible for your sin is you. The only person responsible for my sin is me. And that choice to continue in sin demonstrates something. There's a biblical teaching that we have to consider. 1 John chapter 2 verse 4 says, whoever says I know him, talking about Jesus, having a relationship with God, whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. So you don't keep running back to your sin. You don't keep choosing your sin. It says, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep sinning because he's been born of God. So, so choosing to continue to run after our sin and to act out our sin means one of two things for you and I. At best, you have absolutely no reason for certainty that you're saved. You might be saved, but you can never have assurance of it. Because you continue to run back to sin instead of running to Jesus. You continue to pursue sin instead of pursuing Jesus. So there's no way that you can know for sure that you're a Christian. But more likely, based on what Scripture says, the reality is that you were never saved at all. 
It doesn't matter that you prayed a prayer. It doesn't matter that you got baptized. It doesn't matter that you do lots of things. None of it matters if you don't know Jesus. Jesus says that. Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty, mighty miracles in your name? And Jesus says, get away from me. I never knew you. I don't know you. It doesn't matter what you do if Jesus doesn't know you. And the proof that you know Jesus is that you're becoming like Jesus. And you're not becoming like Jesus though, so that you can know Jesus. You're becoming like Jesus because you do know Jesus. It's not to earn Jesus. It's because you have Jesus. So the sin problem, it's in us and it's who we are. And God could leave us there, but He doesn't. The problem is in you. But the solution is not. The solution is outside you. Salvation is offered as a gift. And like all gifts, the gift comes from God. How do we know this? Because of verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Romans 6.23 The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. You are saved as a gift from God. Your sins are removed from you as a gift from God. God has chosen to save you. Verse 18, Of His own will He brought us forth by the word of truth. Because he decided he was going to. And he does it in a very specific way. God sends Jesus to become a substitute for us. He lives the life that we could not live. He dies the death that we deserve because of our sin. And he gives us a relationship with God. Now remember how all this works. Because when you sinned, your identity became your sin. Your sin became who you are. So if you murder, you're a murderer. If you steal, you're a thief. If you lie, you're a liar. You said that, not me. Like You you admitted that that's the way it works. I mean, I told you to, but you all admitted to it. Because you sin, your identity is sinner. But when Jesus lives the life that we could not live and dies the death that we deserve, He exchanges identities with us. Jesus, perfect Son of God. Never having done anything wrong. His identity is not just not sinner, it's completely opposite everything that is sin. Just perfect, holy, without any flaw. And then there's us. Murderer, liar, thief. The list goes on and on. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says that God made Him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. So when Jesus dies on the cross, and a murderer runs to Jesus, Jesus becomes murderer. So that the murderer might become the righteousness of God. And when the thief runs to Jesus for forgiveness, Jesus becomes thief. So that the thief might become the righteousness of God. And when the liar runs to Jesus, Jesus becomes liar. So that the liar might become the righteousness of God. When you turn to Jesus, Jesus doesn't just take your sin. He becomes your sin. He becomes what you were so that you can become what He is, the righteousness of God. Apart from Jesus, you are still your sin. You're not just still in your sin. That would be bad enough. You are your sin still. And your sin will be punished on you. But when we celebrate the Lord's Supper like we will today, it's those who are taking the bread and the juice that symbolize the body and the blood of Jesus broken and killed on the cross and in eating and drinking we're celebrating what Jesus has done for us it's this exchange that he's made when he became our identity as sin 
And we became His identity as righteous. And today you have the opportunity to experience that new identity in Christ. No longer sinner, but saved and forgiven of your sin by God's gift of salvation through Jesus. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, when he has resisted sin because of the power of Christ in him, because of the indwelling Holy Spirit in him, because of his pursuit of Jesus rather than sin, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Today our invitation for you is that you would walk in new identity today. If you're not a Christian, you need a new identity. You need to allow Jesus to become your sin so that you can become His righteousness. You need to experience His salvation today. It's really very simple. The Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So when you feel, you know the Holy Spirit is, is telling you that you need to do this, well, Pastor, how do I know? You'll know. I, I, can't, I cannot explain it. For some people, some people get really emotional. Some people just, just they, they feel like somebody's just behind them, pushing them to do something. And, and you look over your shoulder because you think somebody's back there. For other people, you'll see them in the white knuckles gripping the seat in front of them going, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. And if that's you, it's a really good sign that you need to do this. So when you know that God is telling you that you need to begin a relationship with Him today, that you need to receive the gift of salvation that Jesus has provided for you, call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Pray and ask Him to take your sin and to give you a relationship with God and begin a life of following and becoming more like Jesus that starts today and lasts forever. And if you are a Christian, keep living out that identity Take a step of obedience to Jesus that maybe you haven't taken through baptism. Jesus was baptized as an example for us. And He calls us to that. Or through church membership. The church is the body of Christ. The people who belong to Him. Learn about Jesus alongside other people through a Bible school. Or a Bible study at Sunday school class. Or, or Bible school starting this week. It's a great step for our students. Serve others so that they can experience the love of Jesus. Grow in your relationship with God through Bible study and worship, prayer, and giving, and Bible reading. Or tell others how they can know Jesus. Whatever it is, our musicians are going to come and they're going to lead us in a time of invitation today. And whatever decision that you have to make, if you know God is telling you that you need to take a step in following Him, then today is a perfect opportunity for you to step out and make that decision. So if God is leading you to make a decision today, we want to give you that opportunity. Jacob and I will be waiting at the front as we sing a really familiar song for most of us, Amazing Grace. As we think about the grace of God, the undeserved gift of God that is salvation through Jesus. We want to give you an opportunity to respond to His amazing grace. Our Father, we bow before you today and we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you show us and teach us in your word, for the ways that you challenge us through your word. Father, we know that, that because we've seen in your word that there's a difference between tests and temptations. God, maybe you're testing us. Maybe we're going through a hard time right now because you're trying to show us something about who you are and you're trying to help us to become more like you. And so would you strengthen us to face those tests so that we can, we can, stand, we can stand steadfast under trial. God, we want to be more like you, so would you help us? But God, when we're tempted, help us to not pass the buck or blame somebody else, whether it's you or, or whoever else. God, help us to understand that the problem is in us and the solution is in you. So we pray today that you would help us to run to you. And Father, if there's one here today who needs to run to you for the first time, I pray that you would give them the courage to do that that they would run to you and experience your salvation and your forgiveness as you take their sin, as Jesus becomes their sin so that they can become his righteousness. God, I pray that you would do that work today. 
And if there's one who does know you today, Father, but they've been putting off a decision to follow you in some way and to live obedient to you in some way, I pray that you would give them the courage to do that. So, Father, help us today to do what you would have us to do. Help us to know and to follow you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're willing and able, I want to invite you to stand as we sing this song of invitation. If you have a decision to make, I want to invite you to come. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Praise than when we 